Facts about Moses that many people do not know. Moses asked God to remove his name from the Book of Life. What happened for Moses to make this statement, and what can we learn from this? This took place at the same time as the worship of the golden calf. The parable of the golden calf sheds lights on human nature and the tendencies of individuals to move away from their commitment to God. It is ironic that while Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments from God, the Israelites were breaking the first commandment, which states that, Thou shalt not have any gods before me. Because of this, it is obvious why the commandments were necessary, as individuals naturally tend to swerve towards sin when they do not have the correct leadership and morality to guide them. The Israelites' impatience with Moses on Mount Sinai led them to create a new god to go up before them or worship. To achieve this, they melted down their gold jewelry and used it to construct a golden calf. The people's impatience caused them to turn to Aaron, and they gave him the responsibility of serving as their spiritual guardian in place of Moses. But before Moses could return with God's further instructions, they had already broken most of the moral commands written on the tablets of law Moses received. Because they were growing impatient while waiting for Moses to return, the people requested that Aaron construct an idol for them. He obediently obliged by transforming their golden earrings into a golden sculpted calf, which was a behavior that was specifically prohibited. Then they began to indulge in revelry, worshiping the idol while also engaging in immoral behaviors. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt, have behaved corruptly. They have quickly turned aside from the way I commanded them. They have made for themselves a cast metal calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed to it, and said, This is your God, Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. So now leave me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them and I will make you a great nation. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians talk saying, with evil motives he brought them out to kill them on the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent of doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens, and all this land of which I have spoken I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented of the harm which he said he would do to his people. Exodus 32, 7-14 In his response, Moses demonstrates why he is considered one of the most influential intercessors in the Bible. Notice the strong arguments he uses. The people were considered the Lord's people, and God had taken good care of them by rescuing them from Egypt. If God didn't do what the Egyptians were unable to do to his people, it would make the Egyptians proud. Therefore, God must remain faithful to the promise he made to the patriarchs. Moses descended the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony, met Joshua on the way, and came to the people as they were carrying on their sensual, idolatrous feast. In a display of righteous anger, he broke the tablets of the law as a witness to the people's wrongdoing. It was only due to Moses' intervention that Aaron was spared from the Lord's wrath. Some of the people were still carrying on without restraint. When Moses called for loyal followers, the tribe of Levi responded and proceeded to slay those who were out of control with the sword. Even close relatives were not spared. Here, the broken law brought death to 3,000 people. At Pentecost, the gospel of grace brought salvation to 3,000 people. The heroic loyalty of the Levites may be why theirs was chosen to be the priestly tribe. Exodus 32, 31-34 Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, O oh, this people has committed a great sin, and they have made a god of gold for themselves. But now, if you will forgive their sin, very well. But if not, please wipe me out from your book, which you have written. Moreover, the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will wipe him out of my book. But go now, lead the people where I told you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. 
Nevertheless, on the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. Moses did not sugarcoat the severity of the people's sin or attempt to downplay its impact. They were responsible for glorifying a deity of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin. Despite the enormity of the people's sin, Moses asked for forgiveness, appealing to God's mercy and grace. If not, I pray blot me out of your book, which you have written. Moses begged God to forgive Israel because of his own self-sacrificed identification with the sinful people. If God refused to forgive, Moses asked to be damned as a sacrifice for his sinful people. Moses felt that Israel had sinned so terribly that the blood of a goat or an ox couldn't cover it. It had to be a man who suffered in their place. Therefore, he offered to be blotted out of God's book if it could somehow rescue the people. God said no to Moses' request, but we can say that God was looking forward to the sacrifice of one greater than Moses, who would give himself for the people, bringing complete atonement. He stands between the people and the wrath of God and says, Punish me. He could not have borne it, of course, it was too much. And yet the noble spirit of Moses shines out so clearly in this great incident. Of course, Jesus had the same sacrificial heart when he died for our sins. Number 9. Why Moses' Body Was Not Found The Exodus story is the story of Moses leading over two million slaves in the greatest escape in history from one of the world's most heavily guarded countries. It is a remarkable account of bravery and miracles, some of which are among the most well-known in the Bible. During that time, the Israelites were led by a man named Moses. He was a witness to more miracles than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob combined. God intervened on behalf of his people and performed a number of miracles, with many of them happening one after another. Some of the miracles may seem like magic, such as when Moses' rod transformed into a snake. However, the majority of the miracles were natural manipulations as God demonstrated his power over everything he had created for the welfare of his people. Moses' life story is truly fascinating. When he was 40 years old, he spent 40 years grazing sheep in the wilderness before returning to live among the Israelites for another 40 years. It's clear that God had a plan for Moses. His encounter with the Lord through the burning bush is also intriguing, not just because of the bush, but because of Moses' hesitations. When God commanded him to remove his shoes as he was on hallowed ground, he also told Moses that he would lead the Israelites out of Egypt. However, Moses tried to come up with five reasons why he shouldn't do it. At first, Moses claimed that he was insignificant. Then, he admitted that he was ignorant and had nothing of importance to say. His third excuse was that he wouldn't be able to convince the people that God had met him and told him to lead them. However, God assured him that his power would be with Moses and he would perform miracles. Despite that, Moses argued that he had a speech impediment that made it difficult for him to articulate his thoughts. So God provided his brother Aaron to serve as his spokesman. The circumstances surrounding the death of Moses remain a mystery as God has not revealed much about it. However, there are three references in the Bible that mention the death and burial of Moses. These references add to the sense of mystique surrounding the life and death of the great prophet. It is known that Moses was 120 years old at the time of his death. Deuteronomy 34.7 Although Moses was 120 years old when he died, his eyesight was not dim, nor had his vigor left him. Moses was still in his prime despite his age when he was called home. Sadly, he passed away alone with his back against a rock on the top of Mount Nebo. From there, he looked across the Jordan to the land that he had been promised to from there, he looked across the Jordan to the land that had been promised to him, but he would never set foot on it. Moses was barred from entering the promised land because of his disobedience at the waters of Meribah Kadesh. He led the Israelites to the very edge of Canaan and was given a glimpse of the land, but he was not permitted to enter it. God gave Moses a glimpse of the land he had fled Egypt for near the end of his life. Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah. There, the Lord showed him the whole land. Numbers 27, 12-13 Then the Lord said to Moses, Go up to this mountain of Abarim, 
and see the land which I have given to the sons of Israel. When you have seen it, you too will be gathered to your people, just as Aaron your brother was. In Deuteronomy 32, 51-52, God explains the reason why Moses was not allowed to enter the Promised Land. God said, This is because you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites at the waters of Mirabah Kadesh in the desert of Zin, and because you did not uphold my holiness among the Israelites. Therefore you will see the land only from a distance, you will not enter the land I am giving to the people of Israel. God kept his word and showed Moses the promised land, but did not allow him to enter it. Numbers 20 describes the event that occurred at Meribah Kadesh's waters. The Israelites arrived in the desert of Zin towards the end of their 40-year journey. The community of Israelites turned against Moses and Aaron as there was no water in the area. Moses and Aaron went to the tent of meeting and knelt before God. God instructed Moses to gather the people and speak to the rock and water would come forth. Moses then gathered the men and took his staff. Then, seemingly in anger, Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses struck the rock twice with his staff. According to the promises made by God, water came out of the rock. However, God informed Moses and Aaron that they would not be able to lead the children of Israel into the promised land because they did not trust him and did not honor him as holy. The punishment may appear severe to us, but when we examine Moses' actions closely, we notice several errors. Clearly, Moses disobeyed a direct command from God. God had told Moses to address the rock. Moses instead struck the rock with his staff. Previously, when God brought water from a rock, he told Moses to strike it with his staff. God had given Moses a different set of instructions for this case. God wanted Moses to show his faith in him, especially after they had been so close for so long. Moses didn't need to use force. All he needed to do was obey God and trust that God would keep his promise. However, Moses mistakenly took the credit for bringing forth the water. He asked the people gathered at the rock, seemingly taking credit for the miracle himself and Aaron, instead of attributing it to God. Moses did this publicly. God could not let it go unpunished and expect the Israelites to understand His holiness. The water-giving rock is used as a symbol of Christ in 1 Corinthians 10.4. The rock was struck in Exodus 17.6, just like Christ was crucified once. Moses speaking to the rock in Numbers 20 could have been meant as a picture of prayer. Jesus was struck once, and He continues to provide living water to those who pray in faith to Him. When Moses angrily struck the rock, he destroyed the biblical topology and, in effect, crucified Christ again. In Exodus 17, the Lord commanded Moses to strike a rock to create an image of Christ as our Redeemer. The Bible repeatedly states in Psalms and Isaiah that Christ is our rock and cornerstone who was struck, killed for our sake. It also says that he will bring forth streams of living water, which symbolizes salvation, John 4.10. In addition, the book of Hebrews states that Christ died once for all, and no further sacrifice for sins is required. So, the Lord intended Moses strike the rock in the desert only once in the scene from Exodus 17, thus picturing Jesus sacrificing once to bring a salvation. The Lord later instructed Moses in Numbers 20 to only speak to the rock in order to preserve the image created in Exodus 17. When Moses chose to strike the rock again, he shattered the picture painted in Exodus 17. Had God not corrected Moses' error, we would have been baffled by the distorted picture, concluding that Christ, the rock had to be sacrificed, struck repeatedly for our salvation. As a result, God rebuked Moses to ensure that we understood the image of the rock preventing him from entering the Promised Land correctly. During the process, the Lord created a new image to support a correct understanding of salvation. By excluding Moses from the Promised Land, the Lord demonstrates that we cannot enter salvation, that is the Promised Land, through the works of the law, meaning Moses, but only through the works of Jesus, i.e. by Joshua, which is the name Yeshua or Jesus. Moses' punishment for disobedience, pride, and the misrepresentation of Christ's sacrifice was steep. He was barred from entering the Promised Land, Numbers 20:12. 12. 
Moses was barred from entering the promised land because of his disobedience, pride, and misrepresentation of Christ's sacrifice, Numbers 20.12. Despite this, we never see Moses complain about his punishment. Instead, he continues to lead the people faithfully and to honor God. Moses, despite being punished for his lack of obedience, died with faith and honor. He was the only man buried by the Lord. A dramatic event later occurred at the same location in the Word of God, but we will discuss that later in the video. The 30-day mourning period exceeded the normal mourning period of seven days. Most of us dislike saying goodbye to those we care about. Separation is difficult, whether at a school or a cemetery. We believe that it is appropriate for us to weep as God's children, but there is no need for us to despair because we know that we have pain here and the departed have no pain there. We may be struggling here, but the departed are not. We know that the departed are at peace in the presence of God right now. Centuries later, we read in the Gospels that Moses spoke with Jesus on the top of one of the mountains, but he never entered Canaan in his earthly life. He was also buried on Mount Nebo, though not by his fellow people. In the New Testament, commentators suggest that Moses was buried secretly and without a grave marker to prevent it from becoming a shrine. This is plausible as Israelites were prone to idolatry. Number 8. Why Satan Fought for the Body of Moses After His Death It is interesting to note that only two angels are mentioned in the Bible, namely Michael and Gabriel. They are the most popular angels in Jewish tradition, with Michael being known as Israel's guardian and the most prominent archangel. On the other hand, according to Jewish tradition, the devil is an accuser, as described in the scripture. Additionally, Jude 9 talks about an event that is not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. It says that Michael had to wrestle or argue with Satan over the body of Moses, but what exactly happened during this confrontation is not described. Jude 9, New American Standard Bible But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him an abusive judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. According to Daniel, angels and demons engaged in spiritual battles for the souls of individuals and nations. Demons resist angels and attempt to thwart God's plans. Jude mentions that God sent Michael to deal with Moses' body in some way. There are various theories about why this struggle over Moses' body occurred. One possibility is that Satan, who is known to accuse God's people, as mentioned in Revelation 12.10, opposed Moses' ascension to eternal life due to his sin at Mirabah and his murder of the Egyptian. Some have proposed that the reference in Jude is the same as the passage in Zechariah 3.1-2. When he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him, and the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. Whatever the source of the account, Jude does in fact seem to direct to the contest between Michael and the devil as true. The Bible contains many references to angels. It is mentioned multiple times that there are good and bad angels who are engaged in important activities on the earth. Additionally, we are aware of the existence of the archangel Michael and the devil. Despite these references, there are two things that we know for certain. First, Scripture is without error. This is one of the core beliefs of the Christian faith. As Christians, it is our responsibility to approach the Bible with reverence and prayer, and when we encounter something that we do not understand, we should pray harder, study more, and, if necessary, humbly acknowledge our own limitations in the face of God's perfect word. Second, Jude 9 is the supreme representative of how Christians are to deal with Satan and demons. The example of Michael refusing to pronounce a curse upon Satan should teach Christians how to relate to demonic forces. Believers are not to address them, but rather to seek the Lord's interceding power against them. Number 7. Why Jesus Had to Meet Moses and Elijah at the Mount of Transfiguration Some places on earth feel supernatural, as if they're close to heaven. The Mountain of Transfiguration is one of them. It felt like the line between our world and the divine disappeared for a short time. It is one of the most mystical events in the New Testament. Picture this, three disciples, Peter, James, and John, are led up a high mountain by Jesus. 
They are unsure of what awaits them at the summit. But as they reach the top, a sight beyond imagination unfolds before them. Jesus, the man they've known, suddenly becomes radiant, shining with a brilliance like the sun. As if this wasn't astonishing enough, two great figures of the past, Moses and Elijah, appear beside him, conversing with him as old friends would. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. Matthew 17, 2. But what if I told you that this mountain holds secrets not just for Peter, James, and John, but for all of us? Dive with me into the story of this otherworldly event, and let's uncover the deeper messages that this radiant mountaintop experience holds for each one of us today. Jesus wasn't the humble teacher or healer they were used to. This was Jesus shining with divine brilliance. It was as if heaven itself had broken through and was displaying its glory right there on that mountain. Elijah and Moses were figures who had lived centuries before, and yet here they were, conversing with Jesus as if they were old friends. This was a powerful sign that Jesus was intimately connected with the grand history and prophecies of Israel. And as suddenly as it had all started, it was over. The cloud lifted, Moses and Elijah were gone, and Jesus was back to his normal appearance. But the disciples would never forget that day. They had seen a glimpse of Jesus' true glory, a hint of who he really was, the divine Son of God. They headed back down the mountain, a bit dazed and overwhelmed. Jesus, however, gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until after he had risen from the dead. They obeyed, but they were left with questions burning in their hearts, pondering what the vision truly meant and what Jesus' reference to his resurrection implied. Peter, always the impulsive one, interjects, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Matthew 17.4 Perhaps Peter, in his excitement, wishes to preserve this moment, creating a permanent reminder of this divine assembly. Yet, the climax is still to come. Moses Despite his pivotal role and close relationship with God, he couldn't enter the Promised Land because of previous disobedience. Although Moses' earthly journey concluded, his story doesn't end there. Fast forward hundreds of years and we find Jesus, the embodiment of God's love and salvation. While Moses represents the law given by God, Jesus embodied the grace and truth that came by him. The transfiguration bridges the old and new, the law and grace, Moses and Jesus. Mount of Transfiguration signified the continuity of God's plan of salvation. Significance of the Mountain of Transfiguration In the Bible, mountains weren't just big hills or rocky spots. They're special places where really important and life-changing events happened. Because mountains are tall, it's like they're closer to the sky and, in a way, closer to God too. Consider Moses and Mount Sinai, for instance. It was on this mountain that Moses met God and received the Ten Commandments, laws that would shape the moral and spiritual fabric of the Israelites for generations. The mountain became the meeting point between the divine and the mortal. Fast forward to the New Testament was the transfiguration of Jesus. The disciples seeing Moses and Elijah appearing and talking with Jesus was not just a display of divine majesty, but a significant moment. Why the Mount of Transfiguration? This Messiah was to be the ultimate sacrifice, taking away the sins of the world and bridging the gap that separated humanity from its Creator. When Jesus was transformed on the mountain, it was significant. It showed Peter, James, and John a peek at how glorious Jesus was before he was born as a human and how he'd be afterwards. This event might also be what Jesus hinted at earlier when he mentioned some of his friends would see him in his royal form before they passed away. What happened? The Bible doesn't give a detailed account of the conversation between Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. However, we know from Luke's account, And behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah, who, appearing in glory, were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Luke 9, 30-31, New American Standard Bible. 
In simple terms, the Transfiguration is a bridging moment. It connects the Old Testament stories and prophecies with the New Testament's revelation of Jesus as the Messiah. The past and the present converge on this mountain, revealing Jesus as the connecting point between them. This suggests they discuss the mission Jesus was to complete in Jerusalem, which was his impending suffering, death, and resurrection. The Coming Suffering of Jesus after the spectacular event on the mountain, where Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John, revealing his divine glory and conversing with Moses and Elijah, the group made their way down to rejoin the other disciples. The air must have been thick with awe as the three chosen disciples tried to comprehend what they had just witnessed. As they approached the foot of the mountain, Jesus and his disciples encountered a large crowd, including teachers of the law who were arguing with the disciples. Number 6. The Untold Truth About the Mother of Moses Jochebed, How One Woman's Faith Saved a Nation Moses' mother Jochebed was a Hebrew woman living in slavery in Egypt before the Exodus. She was the daughter of a Levite, and she married Amram, another Levite. Jochebed means Jehovah Glorified. She certainly lived out her name to bring glory to God. 400 years had passed since the Jews had first settled in Egypt. Joseph had spared the country from starvation, but the pharaohs, who ruled Egypt at the time, gradually forgot about him. We know that Moses was born several years after their marriage. As a newborn, Moses first opened his eyes to a cruel and unforgiving world. He was born in a nation of might, yet he was of a foreign and oppressed during a time when all infants, such as himself, were under a royal death sentence. Moses wasn't the oldest child in his family by any means. At the very least, he had an older brother named Aaron and at least one older sister named Miriam. Exodus 6.20 tells us the names of Moses' parents. Fanciful Jewish legends say that Moses' birth was painless to his mother, that at his birth his face was so beautiful that the room was filled with light equal to the sun and moon combined, that he walked and spoke when he was a day old, and that he refused to nurse, eating solid food from birth. Three months they hid him in some private apartment of their own house, despite the fact that doing so possibly put their own lives in danger had he been found. Some think they had a special revelation to them that the deliverer should spring from their loins. However, they had the general promise of Israel's preservation, which they acted faith upon, and in that faith hid their child, not being afraid of the penalty annexed to the king's commandment. We can overcome the crippling terror of other people because of our faith in God. When Moses was born, the Israelites were experiencing a lot of difficulty in Egypt. The Hittites to the north were a major threat to Egypt at the time. If the Hebrews among them joined with the Hittites, it posed a significant threat to their security. While the children of Israel were forced to work as slaves in Egypt, many of the country's most impressive buildings and monuments were constructed. Because we do not know the precise moment when this form of forced labor started, we are unable to determine how long it lasted. Some estimate the slavery lasted from 134 to 284 years. There is a famous wall painting on an ancient tomb from Thebes, Egypt, modern Luxor, the tomb of the overseer of brick-making slaves during the reign of Thutmose III. The painting shows such overseers armed with heavy whips. Their rank is denoted by the long staff held in their hands and the Egyptian hieroglyphic determinative of the head and neck of a giraffe. Midwives were ordered to put an end to the lives of all newborn male Hebrew children by the king's command. Only female children were to be allowed to live. Pharaoh devised this plan in an effort to exert authority over the Israelite population, which was flourishing and expanding in numbers in the land of Egypt. There was disobedience to this heinous command in many quarters. In order to protect her son Moses from death, Jochebed, Moses' mother, hid him in a basket of bulrushes and set him afloat on the Nile River. Probably the mother of Moses was full of anxiety in the expectation of his birth now that this edict was in force, and was ready to say, Blessed are the barren that never bore, Luke 23, 29. Better so than bring forth children to the murderer, Hosea 9, 13. 
yet this child proves the glory of his father's house. Thus that which is most our fear often proves, in this issue, most our joy. Observe the beauty of providence. Just at the time when Pharaoh's cruelty rose to its height, the deliverer was born, though he did not appear for many years after. In this way, Moses was a foreshadowing of Christ, who, in his infancy, was forced to abscond, and was wonderfully preserved when many innocents were butchered. Exodus 2, 3-4 But when she could no longer hide him, she got him a papyrus basket and covered it with tar and pitch. Then she put the child in it and set it among the reeds by the banks of the Nile. And his sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. In a literal sense, Jochebed did exactly what Pharaoh said to do, put her son into the river. She did, however, carefully place him in a watertight basket. The word for papyrus basket is used only here and for Noah's Ark. In the same way that Noah's Ark represents Christ, so does Jochebed's. But more so, this was a great example of trusting the child's welfare and future to God alone. When Jochebed let go of the boat constructed of bulrushes, she gave up something precious, trusting that God would take care of it. And God had a mighty plan. Under the guidance of God, Pharaoh's daughter discovered baby Moses. Despite being taught to reject the Hebrews due to her culture and upbringing, the cries of the infant touched her heart. Exodus 2, 5-10 Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile, with her female attendants walking alongside the Nile. And she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave woman, and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the boy was crying. And she had pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a woman for you who is nursing from the Hebrew women, so that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses and said, Because I drew him out of the water. God had this beautifully planned for the deliverance of both Moses and subsequently for the deliverance of the people of Israel as well. He expertly steered Moses' parents, the flow of the Nile, and the affections of Pharaoh's daughter to accomplish his will. Using both the clever initiative of Moses' family and the need of Pharaoh's daughter, God arranged a way for Moses' mother to train him in his early years and be paid for it. Jochebed was rewarded by God for her faith, both as she trusted him in hiding Moses for three months and also as she trusted God by setting Moses out on the river. There is no doubt that it was during these formative years that Moses gained knowledge of the God of the fathers and came to the realization that the Hebrews were his fellow countrymen. Moses was a member of the royal family due to the fact that he was Pharaoh's daughter's adoptive son. Josephus, an early Jewish historian, stated that Moses was heir to the throne of Egypt and that when he was a young man, he commanded the troops of Egypt in a successful war against the Ethiopians. Without a doubt, he was brought up with the academic traditions and scientific knowledge of Egypt. According to Acts 7.22, Moses was knowledgeable in everything of the wisdom that the Egyptians possessed and was powerful in both his speech and his acts. Among ancient civilizations, Egypt stood out as one of the most scholarly and technically advanced. It is not out of the question that Moses learned about different parts of the world, different ways of thinking, and different types of music. Jochebed is a mysterious figure about whom we know only a few bare facts. Here are some of the characteristics of Jochebed. First, Jochebed was a strong woman of faith. Second, Jochebed was courageous. Third, Jochebed had a discerning heart. Fourth, Jochebed was a godly mother.